Um, appreciate you coming in for this session on social capital in social leadership. It's, um, it's always one of the more interesting topics um, because it almost describes a system. So um, there are a number of uh, different uh, definitions of social capital, people, what people understand by it. And it, in fact, the term is used in a number of different fields. Um, I, I tend to use it in quite a specific context. And the definition I wrote in the social leadership book um, is the ability to survive and thrive in this new ecosystem, but also to help others to survive and thrive. So I, I tend to take a, if you like, an inclusive view of social capital. It's not just an individual um, attribute or currency, it's a collective attribute or currency. Hence, one of the core roles of a social leader is to nurture and develop social capital in others. So uh, with that uh, definition, if you like, as a starting point, let me just contextualize this session. Um, it, this is number 10 in the series of uh, 12 webinars exploring social leadership. This is the third full sequence of these webinars that I've run. And those of you that uh, know me, which actually I think is most of you who are with us already, uh, will know that I'm unlikely to stick with the same thing three times. So this time through, I'm using the sessions to try to introduce a lot of context and new work and ideas around the topic. And I'm actually going to spend very little time on any of the sort of core material that's already covered in the books or which I've done on the previous sessions. Um, we're also getting to a, an interesting stage in the journey here. We've got next uh, the next session, which is around complex collaboration. It's the focus I'll put on that. And then into exploring social leadership in practice. As ever, kind of working out loud sessions. So sharing, um, evolving uh, thinking as it goes. And it can be as co-creative as you like. Feel free to um, throw in any questions or, or challenges. I know that I should just give a sort of a shout out, I think, to uh, some people here who are in the midst of their social leadership 100 days um, journey. Uh, I know that uh, Susie is and Barry, uh, I know that you and a, a group of, um, of uh, colleagues and friends uh, are going through uh, that journey. So it's been really nice seeing some of the uh, questions and reflections shared about that. I actually had a, an email this morning um, which I found quite uh, almost sort of hard to read um, from somebody who I, I'd met uh, a year or so ago, working around, um, I'll keep it fairly generic, she works around diversity and inclusion in one of the big sort of structures of state, should we say, uh, so a big, big governmental role. And, and uh, she'd written me this note saying, uh, I did my 100 day journey and it made me look around and realize that I needed to leave because the, the environment was so bad. And it's kind of, on the one hand, you know, as a friend, I'm really glad she's left to take herself out of that toxic environment, but really made me think about the, um, you know, I guess our aim here isn't to understand if an environment is bad so that we can leave. Our aim with social capital is to understand what state and environment is so that we can help it be better. So, um, you know, that's our journey that we're on. I tend to start these sessions with uh, a bit of a, a definition. As I've said, your ability to survive and thrive in the social age. And I, I use some of these words very deliberately, our mindset and ability to support others to navigate this new space, which is, is really important because um, most of this stuff starts with mindset. So um, an understanding and a humility to leave aside our previous understanding is very important. And then you can translate it into specific skills and tactical action of what you do about it. But, you know, the starting point is, is internal and reflective. And, um, you know, one thing you may have noticed is that when I, I wrote the, the 100 Days book, Social Leadership 100 Days, it talks about a journey. But the Trust Sketchbook, the newest book, talks about a guided reflective journey. And I, I, I'm increasingly seeing our, our work in that sense to create landscapes that people explore. I think as we move away from the organisation as um, domain specific, where it's built around functional domains, expertise, consistency within those functional domains, 
into a more socially dynamic organization, which is about an interconnectivity. It will still have domains, but they won't be bastions of power. They will be a, an island that we set out from. So a socially dynamic organization will be more interconnected. And hence, I, I hope fairly obviously, we can see why part of that interconnection is going to be the social capital. Um, it's not just interconnected with people that we like in other spaces. It's interconnected across really challenging, complex conversations often conversations of disagreement and dissent um, into different spaces. I've also included uh, this third point here, is our individual and corporate responsibility uh, to our communities. And so I use that again, that, that word responsibility is very deliberate because uh, of two contexts, I guess. The first is that if we want organizations that are fairer, um, at some level or some point, we'll probably have to fight for it. Um, so, in fact, with, the, with the, the, you know, in my response to the, the email I had this morning, part of my response, which I haven't yet written, um, but will have to be, you know, to what extent um, are we actually responsible for trying to change a system uh, rather than jumping out of it, which sounds like a very unfair thing to say, because if somebody's in a, in a um, you know, if somebody's in a challenging situation, you want them to get out of it. But equally, if, if we don't fix these problems, who is going to fix it? And some of the work that uh, Susie and I actually are just embarking on. Quite interestingly, we've got f we're running four community gathering events in the, in the run up to Christmas in the National Health Service, which is a very culturally fragmented type of organization, specifically to hear, you know, hear voices which wouldn't necessarily normally be heard. So we have a responsibility to do this. And the other part of that sentence, which is kind of important, is the responsibility to community. And this ties into a, a broader narrative of the social age. Quite often when I share the map, I haven't got it in this presentation, but if I'm working with a new group or you know, a conference session, I often stick up the map of the social age and describe it as our new ecosystem. And some of the themes that I normally explore around that are the hyper-local to hyper-global. And, and the first point I normally lead off with is the, um, the shift away from uh, geography as a limiter. So, you know, distance used to be a limiter on communication. But today, of course, distance is no limiter on communication. So, to a large extent, our communities become global. But alongside that, in a very real context, our communities are also local. And even in global organizations, we have local responsibility um, to our, our local uh, communities. Um, our footprint, um, you know, can come down very heavily in these spaces. And so um, part, I guess, of social capital is understanding responsibility to individual. And part of it is understanding responsibility to community. The last piece is, is a sort of unashamedly liberal interpretation of social leadership. So you would necessarily have to follow this. But this um, imperative for social justice and fairness is something which I feel is very important, I've already kind of used language to that effect, that our, our responsibility as social leaders isn't simply to the business, it is to the system. And the business is part of the system, but you know, we have a responsibility to help systems be better. Uh, again, actually Susie and I were having a, a somewhat reflective conversation because we're, we're off to Saudi Arabia again um, a little later on this year. And it's a hard environment to be in. You know, we're talking about um, these uh, situations, how do we, um, how do we explore uh, the social movements of change, uh, which are very significant. You, you can engage in conflict or you can engage in conversation. And um, there are times when you need to do both, I guess. Uh, but it's, it's uh, you know, if I'm feeling particularly reflective, so for, forgive me for being quite reflective today, you know, this imperative for social justice is significant. And you can probably start to quantify it a little bit. So we see in the US, um, in a not sort of perfect piece of research, but there, there was some research published um, uh, two or three months ago saying that the final decision individuals make before they join an organization is to check the glassdoors.com score to see how the you know, the community rates it. Now, interestingly, the, 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 I said the research is slightly imperfect because it's just what people say they do. It's not qualified in any way. So, you know, they may say they do it, but not actually do it, or they may say they do it, but it may not be an active decision, um, factor in decision-making. But nonetheless, it's 
clearly a broad awareness of the fact that um, if organizations are not responsible, then maybe they'll find it harder to attract or retain um, the very best talent. So um, I've, I've combined a few elements in the uh, session today. Um, I've brought in a few of the elements from the book just to, uh, of the 100 Days book, just because uh, they're still kind of new and um, I want to just add some of the context uh, around um, some of that. I also want to use a chunk of our time to explore some totally new work, which I've never presented before, so uh, which will be fairly uh, clumsy, I would imagine, which was some of the, the um, writing I did recently around gang structures and coherence within them. And I'm going to try to relate that to social capital, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. But let me um, walk through a few more familiar bits first of all. And, um, just to, uh, to your point, uh, Barry it has to jump off early, I know, um, but thanks for um, joining uh, Barry and for all the awesome work you're doing over at the uh, OU. I, I drew this uh, slide, this image for the book. It's one of the first images I drew um, because it was about uh, ensuring nobody is left voiceless. And this was um, from a, a train of thought, really, which is that clearly the, the technology that we're seeing and the opportunities of the social age are unevenly distributed. So to some extent, um, all of the great things that are going on around us are stretching, are stretching uh, society out even further. The people who have everything and are empowered and enabled are ever more empowered and enabled. And sometimes for people who have nothing, they're, they're left ever further behind. And it's not specifically, it's, oh, let me rephrase that, it's not always because of lack of access to technology. There's a lot of interesting work going on about access to technology, but access to technology doesn't um, rewrite the social context behind it. So, um, for example, when I'm, um, I'm engaged in these mentoring relationships with the Sheree Blair Foundation for Women uh, globally at the moment, and the woman I'm mentoring in Bangalore uh, this year, um, because she's a woman, has to have a license to operate her own business. As a man, she wouldn't have to have that license. So the social context of her work is entirely different. It's, it's, um, it's a structural inequality as opposed to um, uh, purely social or institutional inequality, I guess. So part of our responsibility is to people who may be left behind um, because uh, of aspects other than technology. So uh, when we talk about social capital for ourselves as um, social leaders, we're partly addressing that, not just access to technology, but the etiquette and the use of it uh, behind there. Now, um, you'll, again, those of you who've been uh, sort of following uh, my rambling stream of work over this year would have uh, seen this language imagery about the uh, ecosystem of social leadership. So I'm, I, I'm following and rather enjoying actually one stream of work looking at the organization as ecosystem or the forest of, of social leadership. The, the theory being that some of our, our formal leaders form uh, tall trees within the system, but um, our social leaders are also tall trees but that the organization itself or the forest, if you like, is more than just the trees. It's, it ties into this notion that um, trees cast shade, that uh, the rain falls, that the leaf mold grows. And this, this idea of renewal and growth is, I mean, it's, it's hardly the world's most insightful idea that, um, you know, we drop some leaves and we grow new ones, but we can uh, use it in quite valuable ways to consider what is it that we need to leave behind? And what is it that we still need? And there's also something quite interesting about um, a seasonal cycle of renewal, is that it, it is um, what I would typically refer to as externally moderated. So when something is internally moderated, you know, we provide the impetus and momentum ourselves. When it's externally moderated, the impetus and momentum is given to us. And momentum is a really important thing. I know, um, you know various of us have talked about it before in terms of change. Where does the momentum of change come from? It's the same as the momentum of development and I guess the, the momentum of leadership is, um, it, it is we have to understand to what extent is it internally or externally moderated. 
So some of our work around social leadership is, is choosing, you know, which things will we leave behind. On a, a side note, I'm, I'm just designing at the moment a, a session which I'm going to run in New York in a, a few weeks' time, which is going to be uh, what's called a dereliction walk. And it's going to be very, um, uh, very new. I've never done it before. Uh, I'm quite excited about it. So it will be a two-hour walk through uh, New York taking in uh, the High Line, for those of you that know the, the, the city, it's the, the old, uh, formerly derelict, uh, raised railway, which is now repurposed as an urban park. Um, there's Chelsea Market, which is a repurposed uh, bakery. And Grand Central Station, which was within a week of demolition before it was um, renewed and the new commercial premises were put on top of it. But all three of those examples are about um, structures of power um, and um, integral parts of the operation of the system which fell derelict. So through the course of the walk, we really explore how things fall derelict and how sometimes they survive through being repurposed. But then we think about that as individuals, you know, what things that uh, we know and do are becoming redundant or as organisations, which parts of our organisation are at risk of falling derelict and how will we find the new purpose and change within them. And it's no coincidence that um, entities like uh, Grand Central, which was one of the first US examples of really the conservation movement, Penn Central, was even more grand than Grand Central, but it got demolished um, sort of unthinkably these days. Um, and similarly, the, the uh, High Line were both saved by campaigning individuals. So social movements have changed, socially moderated voices. Um, slight uh, distraction there but I, I'm quite taken with this forest of um, social leadership and this is the crucial uh, piece behind it. Um, th this slide relates to citizenship but it's a broad context around social leadership. It's to understand that no matter if you like no matter how good we are, no matter how lovely, wonderful, kind and generous we are, we all take something out of a system you know, to some extent, we all leave a system worse off than when we find it because we take something from it. But of course, we also put something into it. And it's about the reflective space to find this balance. Um, you know, what do we take? What do we give? And to be mindful of that. Well, I'm always wary of using the, the term mindfulness because it's a little bit in vogue at the moment in, in sometimes rather vague um, uh, senses but in practical senses you know we can think what do we take what do we give and that includes incidentally thinking who do we leave voiceless because again as hard as it is to sort of accept it um, within our communities within the people that we admire and respect and support I'm sure that we give everybody a voice and and um, you know give to those people of our resources our time and our energy but of course we never give that equally to the whole system so to some extent, we all degrade and we all enhance the system. But understanding that and then forging the new connections across that is really about an organization becoming more socially dynamic. Um, I'm just going to jump out here. I'm going to cheat a little bit because I'm trying to, here we are. I thought I could get these in. I'm going to share uh, these with you just for fun. Um, I just had to wait for my, um, for my uh, slides to update because I just had these through. These are um, social leadership leaves. So I'm uh, fortunate at the moment, I've been working with um, Imogen, who's a ceramicist who uh, has a studio nearby and she's been, um, you can't really see it very easily here, but these are, are um, pressed, pressed from actual leaves. So the, the vein and leaf structure is, is from uh, the leaves. And, um, I'm going to be using these um, in one uh, financial service organization initially to talk about uh, another thing I've been writing quite widely about recently, which is rituals and artifacts and choreography. And there is a, a sort of serious purpose behind this. Um, some of you may have heard me talking about the research uh, base we've been building around communities in the National Health Service um, with a research project earlier this year. And when people described the communities which were um, most valuable to them and which helped them to be effective, which is, for me, is a good measure of value, you know, in a quite a sort of serious commercial sense. If we are more effective, then we're, we're, we're going to be doing better. The majority of communities they described that helped them be effective were social. And of the um, 
top 20% of those communities, when we asked them to give a more detailed narrative about them, they said the thing which in, um, enabled them to be effective within those communities was the choreography of engagement when they joined the community. So literally the ways they are welcomed into communities uh, are particularly important. So the way I'm translating that into practice is I'm um, working so with eight of the exec group um, in, the, in the New York on this. And I'm going to use these leaves to talk about artifacts and rituals and choreography um, and first of all, I'll use this with them to talk about how do we induct people into a group. So over the time we're together, how, how do we become one and use these. But then getting them to think about it. So we're then um, bringing in people from their own community and people from outside their community. So um, me members of junior bank staff who can come and share their stories. But getting them to script and choreograph how they will welcome and thank those people for sharing their story with them. Um, so it, it, it's interesting, the, um, we all use uh, rituals every day. Rituals are in fact one of the uh, distinguishing features of uh, what are called eusocial species, so species which um, operate uh, class and hierarchy systems of social organisation. Um, so they are in um, neurological terms actually, they reflect the um, sort of evolutionary peak we've reached. Not all creatures use um, rituals and certainly they don't use gifts. Uh, it tends to be sort of higher functioning um, species that, that do. So it's clear that um, they're not incidental. Um, they're actually right at the heart of how we operate. And quite often, you know, you say to people, when you joined your organization, how did you get your security pass? And, and they say, you know, well, I, I don't know. It was just an envelope on my desk. It's, um, it's the difference between a transactional relationship like that and a tribal type of relationship, a, a ritual of greeting or welcome. Um, it was very noticeable actually when I, uh, I was just on a call into um, one of the big tech companies the other day and uh, the person I was speaking to had a rainbow lanyard on, which is clearly a signifier. You know, it signifies it was on uh, World Coming Out Day last week. It was a very uh, it's a signifier of support in that sense. Uh, and uh, so sometimes we use these things purposefully, but often we, um, we just allow them to fall to transaction. So when we're thinking about social capital, it's worth thinking about artifacts and rituals and how we can um, use them within our, within our work. If I, if I come back slightly, and I'll just sort of pause again here, I'll just remind you that I, I did claim a permission that in this session, I'm, I'm not looking to take a really structured pass through, I'm just sharing um, some of the, the, the newest um, work and ideas around things. This piece actually though, having said that, is one of the older slides. Um, I, I did draw this for the book, but it's one of the first slides I drew about, you know, doing what's right, not just easy. And that's um, uh, the, the, um, the, origin of this was a, a conversation uh, with somebody in an organization who ended up going through a case of uh, constructive dismissal. She was forced out of the business whilst going through um, fertility treatment. So the organization felt that um, her lack of ability to travel would hinder them and so they, they effectively hounded her out of the business. Um, but she was describing the people from amongst the executive team as she was an executive herself who had offered her words of support throughout that process, even though the outcome was the same. And we had quite a heated discussion about it uh, because, you know, words are hollow unless they're backed by action. So, so back to the, um, the earlier definition I gave you, it's the mindset and ability. It's social capital doesn't just stop at mindset. You can't just be a well-intentioned person, um, but act um in, in act poorly and still expect to be a, if you like a, a social leader in the truest sense and this is something which is quite significant i've revisited it again in the trust work in a, a piece of work i don't i haven't put it in here but it's called the triangle of trust and it explores explicitly the relationship between um intention action and impact because even in very culturally fragmented systems, most people intend to be good and do good, 
um, I think the uh, general research quoted is that somewhere between one and four percent of the general population are psychopathic in tendency. But most people aren't. Most people are social in tendency. In fact, um, uh, people are much more likely to be generous than selfish. People are much more likely to be empathic than not empathic. And it conveys um, clear evolutionary advantage to do so. So despite the fact we're all well-intentioned, our actions sometimes become compromised against our intentions. And the language I use in the Triangle of Trust is to talk about organizational pollution, which is really where the context of our work causes us to, um, causes us to make concessions against what we know to be true. And this really is the crux of uh, social leadership in action is, you know, where do we go in that situation when we are in an organization and hence part of a formal structure and a tribal structure, and yet something within that context is not right. There's a very high cost and consequence of dissent. Um, so doing what's right, not just easy, is, is the easiest thing to say in social leadership, probably the hardest thing to do. Um, this obviously is an aligned uh, slide about standing up, you know, standing up for what's right. And this is um, the, the point of taking action. And again, in, in, in the 100 days journey and in, in most of my other work, you'll see I build in. You know, you have to build in the action days. It comes down to this momentum piece. We can spend an awful lot of time thinking about being better, um, but it's when you start to be better that you are better. So um, this move into action is something that we can address at an organizational development level. So if we think about, well, if we want to build social leadership at scale across organizations, we know that in the everyday context, people are going to be busy. And in the everyday context, we're often um, tied up with, with that busyness. So we have to create opportunity and um, some kind of scaffolding of opportunity to stand up and make a difference. And that can be done in all sorts of uh, ways. Um, for example, in uh, one organization at the moment, I'm looking at, at simply at uh, uh, festivals, a uh, festival of social leadership where people who act within their community in a certain way, who build their social reputation in their community can be nominated to take part in a, a festival of social leadership. Um, on the flip side, uh, I'm also looking at a festival of failure, which is where uh, we can come together uh, to stand up and to take ownership individually and sense making collectively of failure, uh, which is incredibly hard to do. You know, many organizations say, oh, failure is fine. We learn from failure, and, you know, failure is good. But the truth is failure is very, very bad indeed in a, in a career limiting or destroying sense. Failure is extraordinarily uncomfortable. So if we really want to learn from failure, uh, organizationally we'll have to create safe spaces and as, as leaders we'll have to create space and opportunity to actually do so. It's a specific competence, it's not just a statement of intent. So let me um, move on. Uh, social capital, uh, you may have seen this slide before, I, I, I sort of quite, I actually drew it when I was in Switzerland, so hence thinking about Swiss army knives. Um, because of this decision-making principle, you know, when you buy a Swiss Army knife, you have to decide which blades you want. Well, when we're thinking about social capital, um, the, the reason uh, we have to think about this is you don't have to be good at everything yourself, but within our communities and broader structure, we need this diversified strength. Indeed, this is one of the key differentiators of the social age, is that we're moving to a large extent beyond individual capability into collective um, collective capability. So your ability to be effective at scale is substantially um, down not only to your own capability, but to that of your close connections, those people with whom you have demonstrated high social capital, those people that you hold safely will help you to be more effective. This, if you like, is the hard commercial argument for social leadership. Uh, I, I strongly suspect that most of our organizations in the world today have everything they need to be more effective already within their four walls. It's held already within the community. What they lack is the permission or capability to access it, quite often because they're using the wrong tool to do so. Um, financial currency, the currency of money will buy you time, 
but it won't necessarily buy you invested effort and engagement. Indeed, in the, the landscape of trust research, we saw that um, people's motivation for acting with trust, for being trusted, for fewer than 14% was it financial. Uh, more than 50% said it was to do with opportunity, um, legacy, to build legacy, the opportunity to help others be successful. People are generally um, extrinsically motivated um, in that way. Now, uh, I'm going to jump through that one because I want to uh, take us into this piece, uh, which is really, um, <laughs> this was a series of five um, articles uh, I wrote, which were really uh, hard to write, um, and it's still very imperfect, but I uh, wrote this as a result of um, several conversations, um, some in the Metropolitan Police in London, uh, around uh, gang violence, uh, which is uh, typically much higher amongst certain populations than others. Um, and secondly, it was from some very peripheral conversations I've been able to have on, on the edges of some of those communities. So um, one thing that particularly spurred me to write this was that in the UK, unlike in the US, um, uh, we don't have um, a constitution and we don't hence have a constitutionally um, embedded freedom of speech. In, in, interestingly, our, our freedom of speech is uh, sort of a tolerated model rather than an enshrined model. Um, and I was quite surprised to discover that there, there's an emergent um, type of music called drill music, which is a, a, a form of rap music, which is very uh, specific, it's very urban. Um, it's typified not only by um, tempo and a pace, but also by a, a violence of language, um, uh, which has caused it to be identified uh, as a, a risk. And currently there are four drill musicians in the UK who are under court orders not to be allowed to use certain words. Uh, and I don't mean, um, you know, the kind of words such as uh, overtly racist or sexist words, which we would expect uh, wouldn't be used anyway, but more everyday words. They're not allowed to use certain phrases um, in their music, which is interesting because, uh, well, it, it's sort of interesting in a number of ways. The first is that, of course, there's a proud history of the protest song. So if you look at the trades union movement, it originated around protest songs. We see um, ultimately blues music coming out of um, songs uh, from plantations and such like amongst uh, slave groups. And this is uh, music as protest and music as part of social change uh, has always been important. Even the Romans incidentally recognized um, the tempo of music when, um, uh, when the, uh, the Roman legions marched, they would uh, march to the words uh, sin and dex, sinister dexter, left and right, to give them the beat that they um, would march to. Uh, but they understood that um, the tempo was important. But anyway, my, <laughs> I'm rambling there slightly. Uh, but the key point with this is that um, you can use the law to control what people say, uh, but you can't use the law to control what people think. And um, previously, I, I've shared various work, um, mainly from two streams of uh, more difficult work I've been doing, one of which is around um, uh, terrorism and insurgency, understanding uh, the rise of ISIS and its model of um, reputationally held power. So that work in the military is about formal codified strength versus socially moderated strength, and specifically the limitations of formal structures in dealing with that. So, you know, why is it that we feel um, held uh, to ransom effectively by acts of terror? Because in, in real context, um, these acts are not... Uh, uh, yeah, sort of recognizing um, and respecting the, the atrocities that have been committed. However, these are not on the scale of um, 
acts of violence which happen in traditional warfare. We're not seeing cities raised to the ground through these. They're, they're ideological threats. In fact, they're ex they represent existential threats. And formal systems are remarkably bad at dealing with those. The um, second body of work has been looking at power structures in gangs, particularly, in fact, in graffiti artists, uh, looking at in graffiti gangs, what are the power structures, mechanisms of induction, mechanisms of promotion, mechanisms of consequence. Um, so anyway, all of that led into this body of work. And I'm, I'm sharing it here around the social capital piece because I've described already, you know, social capital, the ability to survive and thrive within a system. Social capital is about the health of a system. And it's important to recognize that um, there's a reason why uh, historically the Metropolitan Police Service in the UK, which um, any of you who uh, don't know the system, Metropolitan Police deals with, the, um, with London itself, not, uh, in, not actually the city of London, uh, the, the square mile center has its own police force, but every, uh, extra urban London, it's the largest police force uh, hence in the UK. Um, but it has also historically been described by gang members as the biggest gang in London, um, which kind of speaks to the um, matter of perspective, I guess, because we would typically look at police forces as, as peacekeeping. But I guess if you're in a gang fighting against other gangs, to some extent, the police are just another gang. So in this work, I just wanted to explore um, a little bit about, you know, what does, what does that mean? What are the origins of violence in gangs? And of course, what can we do to diffuse it? And I do believe it's sort of it's generally applicable. Of course, I recognize the context is different, you know, within our own organizations to understand coherence within the tribal structures, the, the stasis, the inertia of tribal structures, and actually how we move beyond that. I'll give you the sort of the, the, the top level narrative through this. It, it runs um, from gangs on the left here into conflict, into the loci of engagement, into diffusion and, and what that means is, you know, what is a gang as a structure? We'll start by that. You know, what do we actually mean by a gang? How does a gang differ from an organization? Um, then to understand the nature of conflict, uh, you know, why do we see conflict? Um, it might sound like a stupid question, but it's not um, logical uh, in some ways. You'll see uh, some animal species will engage in conflict, but specifically non lethal conflict uh, during mating rituals and such like. There's no um, there's no collective evolutionary benefit if everybody kills each other all the time. So kind of non-violent conflict is, is actually what you would tend to see uh, as a dominant force, but we tend to engage in more uh, violent conflict. The, the loci is, it starts to tie into the work on tribes and trust, which is that we're all anchored somewhere. And if we understand the locus of engagement, uh, the varied locus of engagement, we can start to think, well, how do we encourage people to move away from that? Uh, into a, a, a different type of space and finally how do we diffuse um, you know how would we diffuse uh, violence uh, or conflict coming out of it so if we think about um, what are gangs well uh, put simply a gang is a, a reasonably stable social structure uh, the same as a, a tribe is a reasonably stable social structure the same as an organization is a reasonably stable social structure or, or possibly a, a number of them held together. Um, what can we generalize out of it? Well, you know, membership is a thing. Um, exactly, the, I, I won't sort of over egg this because it should be fairly obvious. Just as when we join an organization, we are given a role and a position within a hierarchy and a, a formal structure and we earn a position within a social structure, so too we see that in, in gangs. Uh, the most obvious examples would be uh, Hells Angels gangs, where people join and they're not patched, it's called, you know, the, the wearing the logo. You can't wear the logo on, your, on the back of your jacket when you've just joined. You're, you're a neophyte, you're, you know, you're, you have to act in service of the gang to earn that place within it. So um, membership is conferred by others, typically, although not exclusively. So to understand the difference is to understand how, if you wish to join a Hells Angels gang, which is a formally structured entity, you need the permission of others to do so. However, if you wish to join um, certain types of uh, terrorist organizations, you can just choose to do so. Um, there's no formal membership card. There's no patch you wear on your back. So 
those kind of systems of membership are important because they jump. Uh, they, requ they require no direct uh, contact at all. So broadly speaking, you can start to see differentiation. Um, collectives of ideas or collectives of structure. Most organisations are both. So partly there is a formal structural aspect of membership, but there's also a social aspect of membership. And it's useful to see it in those two contexts. Um, and it ties in with certain other conversations that, you know, for money, you buy people's time. But if you want their willing investment and involvement, you need that loyalty, you need that willing investment. And I'd argue we need both of them. There's also some aspect of conformity. And um, broadly speaking, it's to say that with membership comes the obligation of conformity. So some organizations are extremely tight on that. You have to closely conform. Uh, so um, for instance, if you join the Metropolitan Police, you have to conform in terms of ironing your shirt and polishing your shoes and wearing the uniform. And you have to um, follow behaviors which are codified and laid out um, in, uh, in terms of uh, rules and regulations. In fact, there was a member of the police force who was dismissed this week after 20 years of service because uh, for the reason of his dismissal was fa uh, failing to honour the obligations appropriate to the station because he'd rushed, um, he'd rushed checking somebody's driving licence and uh, hadn't done it with enough care and that person had then driven off and uh, been involved in an accident and killed somebody. And that was a dismissible offence because he, he had not exercised the due care. Um, it speaks to the, the care we have to have of the reputation of the whole system. Um, gangs are also uh, entities of moral judgment in a sense here that um, if you belong you are also inherently subscribing to certain uh, social principles and obligations so um, we probably shouldn't ignore the, the, the moral context of, of gangs. Um, Oh, uh, hollow principles was something I'm sort of less certain about, but it, the re I think I said it because I was feeling a bit fired up about um, some of the language we see in organisations around organisational values. Uh, and I always say it's, it's not the words are almost irrelevant. It's the journey we take to get to the words, which is what adds value. So if you work for an organization and the organization has written the values and you just say, yes, these are our values, they're a bit hollow. They're not really our values until we live them or go through the journey to discover them. And that's what's sat behind that. So, you know, if we think about, you know, well, what is conflict? Uh, aside from the sort of fairly obvious uh, answer of, you know, somebody punching you in the nose is conflict. Well, for sure it is. But um, the, the nature of conflict you can track down to a number of underlying principles. Um, one is around identity. Uh, so you, you may have heard me say before, I've, I've been really evolving the definition, the working definition I use of community. In the social leadership handbook, I said, uh, communities have shared value and shared purpose. And largely now, I don't believe that's true. I think some communities have shared value and shared purpose. But almost the only thing I can think of that all communities share is that they are entities of exclusion, um, almost by definition. If I can say you're not in the community, then the community is coherent. It's defined by who is not in it. If you had something which anybody or everybody could be part of, um, I'm not entirely sure that's a community. I think that's just sort of the base level of society or something. Um, but it, it made me think about this piece of, um, Com community represents um, identity. There tends to be some kind of coherence of identity within a community and hence conflict emerges because it's our identity versus your identity. So the, you know, the obvious examples, uh, you know, people who would identify as being in a white supremacist community uh, probably wouldn't share values with those of us that aren't in that type of community. So identity is, is inherently tied up in conflict in that sense. Um, opportunity is quite important, um, although I've not really been able to consider how you would measure this yet, but uh, something about membership of uh, communities may relate to opportunity. And this was very much in my mind in relation to um, gang structures. 
uh, because I had dinner with a, a friend in DC uh, recently who's a very good friend, but we argue a lot because um, we're quite opposed on a few fundamental things. Um, and one of those is that he subscribes very strongly to the uh, notion of the American dream that anybody can work hard and, you know, achieve anything. And he's absolutely right, except that only, you know, one in a million people who grow up third generation, unemployed, impoverished in a school with metal detectors on the door with no uh, paternal role models or, or sometimes maternal role models. You know, it, it's it, you're very lucky if you can work yourself uh, out of that chance. And so, of course, what gangs offer very often is um, beyond family is, is structure. Um, it's easy for us to, you know, I think, you know, most of us here work in organizations or have worked in organizations and we're used to structures of recognition and reward and you know maybe for us thinking about somebody cleaning the floors of subway is like the bottom of the, the pillar but of course that's because we exist in organizations in a world of opportunity and plenty of role models that show us how to get there uh, plenty of people have no sight of that opportunity so you know my sense is that there's a, a, stru a structural reason clearly why uh, gangs are more prevalent more dominant in, in some spaces and that's why we see disproportional membership of gangs and um, disproportional distribution of violence of course so most gang violence in london will be black on black crime it's not you know people coming out of the ghettos to hold me up at gunpoint on the central line that's not what really happens it's internally moderated intra-gang um, types of violence Part of the dynamics of membership probably um, drives us towards conflict. And I think this is equally true in organizations, certainly in an entity like the National Health Service. You know, if you wish to be a nurse, you almost by definition have to be opposed to the accountants. Um, it, 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 it's it's um, actually held in, in rituals and, and mythology, some of the, the structural uh, things. You'll see it in other entities. Um, most obviously, it tends to be between sales teams and engineering teams uh, or, or between compliance teams and operational teams. You know, they're, they're mythologically held um, opposition. So uh, conflict probably closely relates to some of this identity and opportunity. The, the loci of engagement is interesting and this is strongly influenced by the work um, in, in the military on how do we diffuse um, ideological power effectively so uh, put simply it's something like this uh, we obviously maintain a very strong narrative which is there is the law of civilized society and there is terrorism and people with these ideas dogma and belief um, but of course if you look at any of those structures it's not a, a black and white situation uh, people drift from one to the other, the same as they drift in and out of gangs. So people, very few people in the world start with a sort of intention of absolute evil. People tend to drift into it and are welcomed into things. So interestingly, when you operate a black and white, when you operate right and wrong, you're left with very few options except conflict, um, which takes you to the place of, uh, you know, vomit into submission or um, in gang contexts, prosecute it into submission. However, um, there's a whole series of gray spaces. So if you start to look at membership, you know, why are people in gangs? Well, there's no opportunity. Well, where's the dialogue about opportunity? Um, if you look at, um, I've been doing some interesting work actually with a, a Catholic organization in the US for four years. We've been doing research into, into the decline of belief and uh, they've just published uh, the study which shows that the strongest reason why people, young people leave the Catholic faith is because they have no opportunity to have a conversation about the nature of belief. They have to believe or they are a non-believer and they're left with an arbitrary binary choice and it might be that they would get there by themselves if given the opportunity to explore um, the nature of belief, but it's not, it's, if you like, it's not open for discussion. So our mechanism to look at this is exactly the same mechanism as we should be looking at to drive organizational change or to build social capital. It's cre to create spaces for people to invest themselves in the conversation. Um, spaces of ambiguity. So in the military work, I talk about ambiguity. Um, because typically military systems have a very low tolerance for ambiguity. 
legal systems typically also have a very low tolerance for ambiguity. But interestingly, uh, the work of ethnographers in urban contexts shows some very interesting things. So um, uh, the, um, there's a book called Hollow City, uh, which is written by, uh, I'm not going to remember his name off the top of my head now, it's on the tip of my tongue, uh, ethnographer working in New York City, uh, describing, um, uh, describing after 10 years of his work with um, homeless populations, um, prostitutes, and the owners of, um, of, uh, sort of corner shops that probably specialize in uh, what we would call top shelf type of material. So uh, the more rudimentary um, uh, kind of retailers of society. Uh, actually, you look at how uh, law enforcement interacts with them, you very often find extrajudicial justice being carried by uh, community leaders, police leaders and gang leaders coming together outside the system in order to explore um, ways of making their society better. So it, it, it's reckoned that somewhere between 50 and potentially 90% of the economy of a city like New York operates in the gray rather than the visible black space. So that, that research is, indicates that at least 50% of value transactions in big cities are actually held through bartering, favors, those kind of transactions within social structures, which takes me back to the fact that organizations, be they organizations of manufacturing and distribution or organizations of governance and law, really are fictional in a meaningful sense. We make them up to be the structures that govern us, but really much of the moderation of um, social uh, behavior and action he is held within the community itself. So how can we, uh, explore the loci of engagement. Well, it's by listening to different types of stories, hearing stories that we might not want to hear, but being willing to listen to them. Understanding individual choice and giving people place to make individual choice. Um, Visualising alternatives is important at a cognitive level. As storytelling creatures, um, this is how we make decisions. Be it the decision to buy a new car, the decision to uh, go on a first date are ex or the decision to leave or join a gang are exactly the same cognitively. We visualize ourselves in that role. We play out a number of different scenarios. We carry out some rather imperfect cost benefit analysis and then we move into action. Um, so understanding both the neurological basis for it and the importance of visualization is important. Not least to introduce the role of doubt. This is kind of important as well. When people describe leaving gangs, um, they describe often the role of doubt. Uh, and so we should understand that. Uh, if you're not going to be able to tear people out of an existing system, maybe we can just understand how doubt can play a part and then create opening, welcome, ambiguous spaces to explore difference. And finally, but, you know, this last piece is really about structures of power and diffusion of power. So um, there may be a need for conflict, but it doesn't have to be opposition or conflict. We can create spaces where we can be um, uh, posed in ideas rather than in, in true violence. Memorials are important. You know, when people leave something behind, we can't dismiss it. If they leave a gang, it doesn't cease to be part of their past. It's part of their story. And the same in organizations. Often when we see organizational transformation, the old is relegated to the dustbin, the old logo, the old team identity, the old structure. We just try to legalize it and hide it away. But in fact, maybe we should memorialize it. Um, uh, and, and be tolerant of ambiguity. So that was really a pass through that. I probably rambled on a little more, but I wanted to share that with you because it's, uh, you know, as you can see, it's a kind of, uh, you know, is it about social capital? Well, it's kind of about the functioning of social systems. Is it about gangs? Well, it's as much about organizations as about gangs. It's as much about organizational change as it is about, um, you know, violence in gangs. But I'll, I'll, I'll just wrap us up really there, I think, because, um, because uh, we're almost out of time. Uh, I've been talking away, so feel free to throw a qu any questions in there if you like. But if not, I'll, I'll just while you're thinking of any, um, jumping through all this exciting stuff I would have talked about if I'd been more focused. Um, the uh, next, oh, come out of it. Where is the next webinar? 
is uh, Sam will give us the dates and the details, but is on uh, collaboration and complex collaboration. Uh, over to you, Sam. Perfect timing. Yes, that session is at 2 p.m. Uh, UK time. That's Tuesday, the 13th of November. Uh, thank you for that, Julian. That was very interesting. Um, good to explore it in that in a more sort of familiar way. I've learned a lot today. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any other questions? There's nothing in the chat window so far, but you have the opportunity to just un unmute and shout out. If not, um, if you do want to follow up at any point, you can reach Julian uh, or myself or Susie or any of the other CSOC crew on Twitter, uh, or you can get us on a general uh, email handle at hello at csoclearning.com. As I mentioned before, we'll be sharing this uh, recording today on YouTube within the next few hours and we'll share that out on Twitter as well. So look out for that. Feel free to pass it on. But unless there are any other questions for Julian, all I'll say is thank you very much for, for joining today. Thank you, Julian, once again. Thank you for everyone who's been here and been part of this session. And I hope to see you all again in a few weeks' time. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.